we've got another great um, session coming up um, between now and 11 o'clock. And I'm very, very pleased um, to welcome some more experts who are going to help shed light on, on what's happening in their world. And today, as you know, because you joined us, um, what we're here to talk about um, today is the, is the impact on manufacturing. So today we're going to take um, very much a manufacturing lens, looking at the nuts and bolts of actually making things, um, making things a reality and then getting them into markets as well to understand what's happened in real time with some, some manufacturers who face very, very different challenges um, to our own. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves in the timely fashion one by one. So first of all, good morning to Mr. Paul Cook. Paul, good morning. Morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Paul Cook. I um, run a uh, manufacturing company. We're based out in uh, West Auckland and also up in Tianjin, China. So we manufacture high reliability transformers for electronics for industry. Um, so through the COVID crisis, we've, we've had an increase in demand uh, due to one of our, our major customers. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, I guess our battle has been uh, the ability to kind of step up and meet that demand. Ah, perfect. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Look forward to digging into that demand challenge um, just in a second. Um, I'm going to move one step to your right in the game of chess that is doing anything on Zoom. I think he's on your right. Will, good morning. How are you? Morning. Um, so, hi, I'm Will. I'm, um, I'm, an, I'm from a little business um, in West Auckland as well, actually. Um, so, go the West. Um, we, we, our brand's called Honey Sticks. Um, we manufacture um, crayons, actually. We're trying to dominate the world of crayons. Um, and I guess, yeah, we've been through a really similar challenge where we've had, I guess, a huge increase in demand. Um, and we're a very small team, small business. So, we've had to really find how we adapt, how we grow. Um, and then I guess how we how we find contingencies and put plans in place to continue to fulfill that demand. Ah, fantastic. Thanks for joining us this morning. We'll look forward to chatting more to you in a little bit. Um, we're going to go from crayons to, to fish. It's not the natural jump, but Simon Thomas, <laughs> um, good morning. Kia ora. Uh, yes, Simon Thomas. I'm a divisional manager for Amiga Innovations, uh, which is a division of the New Zealand King Salmon Company. Uh, New Zealand King Salmon based on the top of the South Island. We're the largest producer of uh, king salmon in the world, um, including about 550 people, publicly listed uh, company. And um, yeah, obviously we got a lot of fish uh, just in places like that over there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I uh, hit up the division of looking at byproduct, uh, waste minimization, byproduct utilization. So our COVID experience has been a, um, a world of, of black and white where uh, the salmon fell off a cliff uh, with 70% food service produced, but byproducts had its busiest month ever. So, uh, yeah. Ups and downs. Ups and downs. Yeah. Thanks, Simon. That's yeah, great to have you here. And finally, from fish to umbrellas. This is turning into some sort of surrealist joke. Um, Todd Boyden. <laughs> <laughs> <Todd. laughs> yeah, hi. Hi, guys. Uh, kia ora. Uh, yeah, uh, my name's Todd Graydon. Uh, Global General Manager for Blant Umbrellas. I've probably spent the last 25 years actually with small businesses. I was a founding member of 42 Below, um, cheeky little vodka startup that um, sold out to Picardi a few years later, um, and also part of the trilogy, the Akoya uh, trilogy team that um, took on the world. Um, we don't talk too much about all the failures we've had, but we've had plenty. Um, which we definitely hold up all the wins. Um, but yeah, look, I've, I've lived in China. I've been traveling to Asia for 20 years, probably more of a um, exporter across a, a number of categories, um, probably a little bit light on manufacturing, but having spent uh, a couple of weeks up in our factory twice now since I've been at Blunt over the last two years, got a good feel of the, um, you know, the China-based factory manufacturing um, plant. And our goal one day would be to kind of bring that stuff back down to New Zealand, but uh, we haven't navigated those waters yet. Uh, just coming out of COVID, you know, at the end of the day, um, we just need rain to sell more. So, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter about the environment. But it's good to, good to be here. <laughs> well, I think you're, you might be in luck. It's actually looking pretty picky um, uh, here right now. <laughs> um, at the hill of the White Zacharies. Um, um, Hamish, it'll be good um, to hear um, what everybody's been up to from a manufacturing point of view out there in the audience. Shall we have yeah. a poll? We're we'll launch, uh, launching a poll. So you'll see a poll, a two-step poll here. That is, where do you manufacture? You can choose more than one. So is it New Zealand, China, Australia, other Asia, Pacific Islands, other? So again, you, if you're manufacturing in a couple of places, um, that is perfectly fine as well. And then the second one is, are you exporting already? Yes or no. <clears throat> so that is, uh, 
being quickly answered, which is great. All right. So get your everybody, everybody out there, um, just jump on and let us know um, how yeah. you respond to that poll, so we can get a feeling from um, from mm -hmm. where you're up to and what you need from us today. When that's um, when that's in work, I've actually got um, just some very quick shout outs um, to make um, because yeah. although Hamish and I make this look well, both professional and seamless. As, as no doubt you've, you've come to recognize over the last few weeks um it's like there are a huge number of people um behind us um every week who are, are working tirelessly to make this um to make this happen to round up um the best opinions in exactly the right time to bring you um, um the perspective that's so been so valuable through this crisis um first of all i'd just like to extend some some sincere thanks um to the team at kia in particular to, to mel lim and to tanya bearsley um they've been um, amazing at their support and reaching out to the network um, around this. And as you know, that, that Kia um, is there to connect New Zealanders and to grow all of our business networks worldwide. So it's an amazing resource. Um, if you want to find out more about what they do, um, go and look them up on kianewzealand.com. That's kianewzealand.com. And Hamish, I'm just, we'll put this into the, into the chat so you can follow that through. Or if you jump on the webinar page, there's the logo there. You click on that logo, it'll take you through to a whole world of Kia happiness. Um, other big shout outs um, on top of the amazing team from Kier, um is the team from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, in particular um, Jeremy Hall. Um, and of course, it's like you know that uh, the, the MFAT team is there to try to drive and support and underpin the prosperity that we're bringing to the country. Um, they've been working tirelessly through this, this process, supporting this webinar, but also um, um, supporting individual exporters with the availability of their export services. Um, if you don't know and you haven't come across the MFAT export help desk tool, then it's a critical bit in your armory right now. Um, if you, again, if you jump onto the, um, jump onto the webinar um, homepage there, you'll find um, details of the link through to it. But Hamish will put that link into the chat as well so you can go through it. It's well worth checking out because it's an amazing resource um, for you all out there. So um, to, 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 to Kier, to Mel, to Tanya, and to Jeremy from MFAT as well, huge thanks um, just for being out there and supporting us and also for supporting them, the wider exporting community in New Zealand. You're doing an amazing job. Couldn't do it without you. Um, Hamish, what's the response to the poll? Okay, so here we go. So we've got a, uh, a large percentage of people manufacturing in New Zealand. Which is, which is great, and a few in China, some Australia, other Asia, Pacific Islands, and, and other, but a you know, good, good um, percentage here in New Zealand, and 76% and of people are exporting already, so a little bit more than, than usual. So um, interesting, so that's great. So we've got uh, a good, good um, New Zealand manufacturing base here. So that's great. So that, that'll provide some context for the session today. Right. So um, back over to you. Uh, given, given, um, given the results in the polls, don't forget the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Right there in the middle of your screen, if you're all mess over it, there's a Q&A button. Um, it's like, if you've got questions that come up as the conversation goes, you know the rules, stick it in the Q&A. And then we'll, we'll come around and have some conversation um, and answer those in turn a little bit later on. Um, but also feel free to throw in any thoughts and comments um, in the webinar chat as we go. And before we get into the business of the day, just pointing about um, anything big that's happened this week um, in terms of a link that we'll get out to you as well that's, that's worth a read. There was the um, trade recovery strategy and um, was formally announced by the government this week by Minister Parker. Um, very interesting um, angle on protectionism and what we're doing um, as a country um, for that and also in our support for NZTE as well um, and how that's going to mean that we're going to get more companies and um, more deeply connected to NZTE, which is great, almost doubling the number of F700s um, customers that NZTE are being funded by Treasury to support. Um, so great news there, and um, we'll get that link out to you as well, because if you haven't read the transcript, it's well worth, uh, well worth the browse so that you're keeping up to date um, with the bigger picture. Um, but without um, further ado, Hamish, should we get into the business of the day? Absolutely, let's do that. All right. Um, I think... Probably let's start with the downside. It's our favorite place to start with. I know this has been a challenging time um, for you all. I mean, just to turn to you first, Paul, um, um, uh, what, what challenges have you really faced um, uh, to continue your manufacturing during lockdown? What, what, what's it felt like going through this? Yeah, uh, well, we, I mean, I guess we were, as, as, as far as shutdowns of factories go, we were a little bit lucky in the fact that um, China was, was shut for the month of February and then our New Zealand manufacturing base was, was closed down through March. So that sequence helped a lot. Um, but I, I think um, keeping, 
you know, we, we had a, a full order book. And so we don't like to let down customers, but that's what we were facing, uh, staring down the barrel of doing. Um, so it's, it's, we've been, um, I guess, fortuitous and the team, the, the team have been very good in working with our customer base to make sure we're managing those expectations, um, longer lead times and all those sort of things. Uh, but also, obviously, the, the ramp in, up in production has um, is, is made that difficult as well. Um, so the sales team have been working very hard on just on just keeping those customers happy, trying to prioritise those orders um, and get it out when we can. Um, you've we will touch on some of the issues that you've had later with actually riding a wave of demand, which has been particularly, yep. particularly challenging for you. Yep. Just just really really brief. What what's in terms of people versus plants? Um, what what's been the bigger challenge for you as a leader at this time? Uh, I, th I think I think the communication, you know, getting things. So obviously, as you got to ramp up demand, we've got a very unusual situation out there in the market, um, and so um, we're all we're all keen on that kind of signal that comes through. But how long is it going to last? And I think the people piece is the challenge, right? In terms of getting the communicating those expectations down across countries to to other factories to make sure that everyone's on the same page on what needs to be happen and what needs to happen. So, yeah, it's uh, you 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 don't say it once. You've got to get that message out there 10, 20, 30 times to make sure it lands. It's just repetition. <laughs> yeah, know where you're going and then be really clear. I mean, yes. these are universal challenges, aren't they, Todd? I mean, like you would have been. I mean, your, all your manufacturing, if I'm correct, is is out of is out of China at, at the present moment. And um, what did you do to try to brace for impact as you saw this crisis looming back in January, February? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that the biggest challenge for us was the unknown, um, and uh, we came out of a Chinese New Year holiday period for the Chinese straight into you know, the COVID-19, you know, in, in Wuhan. So uh, we we lost manufacturing, we lost two larger production runs in a short amount of time. So we missed out on obviously that those export orders um, and they're both export orders um, bound for the UK and the UK, uh, sorry, and the US. And like, I guess, I guess, yeah, what do we do to brace for impact? I mean, ultimately we didn't, what it did is highlighted a lot of risk to our business. Now, we've been looking at the risk over the last uh, six to 12 months, and we had started um, making plans to use our existing uh, manufacturer in China. It's also got a second uh, manufacturing plant down in Cambodia, and we had already done a sample run of a couple of thousand units out of Cambodia. Um, and so um, we, we'd already, we were already on the track to changing the way we do business, um, but what it has highlighted, is actually, is, is Cambodia a big enough move away from China, if that is indeed the case? And, and, and what are the other options? C can we bring it further back down south? Can we bring it back down here to New Zealand? So we're, we're, we're you know, ideally, we, we, uh, we were building a strategy, we just stayed in the strategy. Yep, we were, we were keeping agile and nimble, uh, but, but we stayed on track. But this is, this is, it sounds like you're almost thinking the unthinkable as, as, as you're coming into this. And, and, and risk, I think, is a word that's going to come back on our lips very many times today. I mean, Simon, the risk that you faced like coming into this through the uncertainty that Todd just describes, um, how did it feel for you? And how did you start to, to, to manage the risk that, that you, could, you could see and you certainly couldn't control in the short term? Yeah, I guess who saw it coming, didn't they? Um, I guess if you look at the New Zealand King Salmon Company, um, it was, it was hard and again it highlighted weaknesses rather than strengths up until now the, the King Salmon Company had, had sold huge volumes into uh, food service um, you know salmon <clears throat> tends to lend itself that way um, and it was chilled exported to 25 countries around the world uh, and it's, it's highlighted our, our risk um, you know to, to channel exposure um, <clears throat> the work I do in pet food I guess uh, what we saw is that um, you know, again, we saw it coming. All we saw was was upside. You know, increased demand, uh, people wanting to, to pantry stock. Uh, I think New Zealand pet food seen as being quite um, uh, resilient, safe, and has a high reputation. Uh, you know, helped um, uh, push push forward. You know, again, it's just shown to be a completely um, uh, resilient industry against uh, <laughs> a global downturn. Um, Pet industry just keeps on motoring along. And again, uh, to, to de-risk, I guess it shows uh, in our company diversification. Uh, let's try and get away from from one channel, uh, one uh, one area that we, we heavily rely on. Um, yeah, so for us, it was um, 
I guess, showing where we were weak rather than where we were strong. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, Will, the, the risk question for you is like, how did you brace for impact and how have the risks changed um, as you come through this? Um, yeah, it's a, it was a really interesting ride, actually. I think, um, I think we, we play in, the, I guess, the home crafting space. Um, and especially with everybody staying at home, locked in doors, uh, they look for something to do online, right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to draw some pictures. Yeah. Um, so um, I guess as we saw this coming, um, we had to make some really tough calls around what we do with stock, where we send stock and how quickly. We found that we uh, our stock that we had over in different markets um, and what we're about to dispatch in the factory had to get redirected to different areas um, in different markets. So some tough calls for um, some customers, um, but then some better calls that we had to make for our business and our long-term viability. Um, we play um, heavily in the Amazon space in the US, um, as well in the UK, Europe, um, and having to deal with the unknowns um, and the uncontrollables from those channels um, mean we just had to make some decisions and, and roll with it from the start. Yeah, and just commit to that strategy and, and head yeah. through. Um, yeah. What's been, it's like, it's like we've, we've heard, Will, in, in, in a few times over the last few weeks um, of, of serious issues trying to get product into Amazon's DCs um, over there in the US. And that like, unusually, like, like unusual parts of the supply chain have actually broken down. Um, has that started to mend itself now? What's, what's the latest? Yeah, it's, yeah, it has started to mend itself slowly. I think we were... Um, and, you know, we're, we've, my business partner and I, we're a big believer in go with your gut feeling. Um, we sent all of our stock into Amazon um, two days before they closed their doors. So we're very, very lucky because we saw something coming. So, I mean, that's my, <laughs> my insight that, you know, if, if you feel like something's going to happen, go with your gut. Um, from, from what we've seen now, it's a, it's a full, uh, we're able to send anything um, and everything we can into Amazon um, yeah. and keep fulfilling demand um, across all markets. Um, yeah, I think some categories are impacted and some um, categories aren't. But for us personally, we're our category and the children's toy category is, is fine. Um, and I guess it's for us, it's playing with what the new normal is. Um, is are we going to drop back to where we were before? Um, and how do we forecast that through our supply chain? Um, is that is a challenging piece. So um, I mean, in the short term, I think we're going to see a new normal and a new baseline, which is you know it's going to be fifty percent higher than where it was beforehand. Um, and so we got a plan for that, uh, and then, but six months down the track, it's hard to say at this stage, but we're just going to plan for it and make sure, our, I guess, make sure our manufacturing is um, geared up to fulfill um, a higher demand, um, as well as trying to de-risk some, some big cash flow issues from a small business point of view and make sure we're not tied up all of our cash in the stock, um, which is going to be the short-term um, challenge. Yeah, success definitely is a double-edged sword. It, it brings yeah. the challenges and benefits. I'm going to touch on that in a second. And um, just on the like Todd, like from a like operating purely within China point of view, from all the all the stories we've heard of broken parts of supply chain, um, what's the what, what's it like at the present moment? I mean, I, I know that's like Chinese domestic flights are up to sort of they're only minus twenty percent from where they were um, uh, at the end of last year. So things appear to be moving as normal. What, what's your experience getting products in and out of factories? Yeah, look, um, you know, uh, having discussed this with our factory uh, just earlier on this week, that they, they, um, they, they tell us they are operating at full pace um, and they have been for uh, the whole, or well, our, our time through the lockdown anyway, so for the last four weeks, five weeks. Um, look, I, I think there is definitely a shift um, in the way that people are thinking about where they're going to manufacture in the future. And I believe it is coming back down through Southeast Asia. Um, and I think that, you know, pe um, operators that can will look even further afield. They may start looking at South America. They yeah. may start looking, you know, down here. But look, uh, the, if you speak to the Chinese, you'll get one line that they want it all to stay there and they'll, they'll be giving you the, um, the Chinese l line, <laughs> which is everything's A-OK -okay up here. Yeah. Going fine. Yeah. I mean, uh, Paul, your business straddles both manufacturing here in Auckland and in, um, in China as well. well what, what's your experience at the present moment? Is, it, is, is China back operating as normal in terms of logistics? Yeah, for, for us it has been. Um, obviously, you know, we've had to do some air freights and things as well, which has been difficult, but we've managed to pull it off. But um, yeah, we've actually, we're actually sort of up of our factory at the moment. 
Um, and so we have been able to get that out on boats um, and and air freight as needed. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty good. Um, on the on the kind of supply risk, yeah, we've been playing around with that. Uh, you know, do we do we have a second source in South Southeast for a while now as well? Um, we haven't we haven't enacted a plan, but yeah, we're we're still looking also. So we're all kind of, I mean, we're all hedging, looking towards a plan B here. If we kind of like yeah. zoom out and look at the macro impact of this of this crisis, do you, do you, do you think it's possible to to say whether um, onshoring or offshoring has been has been more hit and more affected by this crisis, or is its global nature just mean that it doesn't matter where you are, um, you, you're going to get shoved around a bit? Yeah, I think for us, it's not so much about is is China right. It is it is still right for us, um, yeah. and and it will be in the future. I think it's more about the uncertainty that permeates the globe. So, you know, we could go and set up in Vietnam, but something could happen in Vietnam. But we've got China. Something could happen in China, but we've got Vietnam. I think it's just having that that second option when when things go wrong. Yeah, and I guess this, this is, the, this is a, 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 a more, more than one options and redundancy is something which we're all having to build more into our, into our business. Yeah. I mean, Simon, you've, you've been hit by success um, during this crisis, <laughs> from the conversations before. Again, it's just how the, the, the riding the wave of additional demands um, as people stay at home and want to treat their pets, um, it's, this creates huge headaches, huge headaches, even when you're manufacturing here. Can you tell us a little bit about, about what you've experienced as that, as that wave has gone up and our access to markets and face-to-face -face has gone down? Um, yeah, I guess our, our journey for production capacity started some time ago when uh, you know, we launched uh, our, our pet food range into New Zealand and then and, um, got into China. And what we found is that our, our top manufacturer was unable to meet demand. So we, we identified this very, very early on as something that we needed to fix um, and fix quite rapidly. So uh, through a period of time, we, we built redundancy into our uh, supply chain so we could uh, continue to grow. Uh, we're launching into North America uh, later this year. So between New Zealand, China and North America, uh, and we're in South Korea at the moment as well, we needed to be able to grow uh, those markets. We're not going to go in at uh, full capacity. We're going to go in and build those markets sustainably over a period of time. Uh, we need to have faith and trust in our time manufacturers to produce products consistently into a standard. So already we're taking um, some business out of our, our current time manufacturer and moving it to a, a second party that will do some of that production for us uh, to allow for that growth and also to give us a bit of um, safety blanket if, if to be a major um, malfunction or, or a fire in, in one of our time manufacturers, we have the ability just to switch over to the other and uh, continue to produce, albeit somewhat, you know, maybe down a little bit. So for us trying to keep up uh, has, hasn't been too difficult. We had uh, planned for additional capacity coming down the pipeline. It just got here a little bit faster than we anticipated. <laughs> Yeah, so this active redundancy in your in your um, capacity at a time of constrained cash flow, this is it's quite hard to justify. I mean, Paul, you've been riding the same double edged double edged wave. What are we talking about here? The same problems yeah. that come with success <laughs> as demand for your for your products has gone through the roof. Too many metaphors. Um, it's yeah. like it's like this is. Uh, are you able to to, to have some um, some spare capacity, some planned redundancy in in there to enable you to to, to flex the size of it? Yeah, we we do. I, I just think we we didn't anticipate. We never anticipated it jumping up as much as it it has. And of course, it, it'll it'll come back down to a point. I, I think the style of manufacture that we do is quite labour intensive. So the, it's not a massive capex outlay um, for us when we do increase demand. It's a it's a bringing in the people problem. So um, and and the team in China have done an amazing job with being able to to get the right people, train them up, and 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 get them going. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's using um, third-party manufacturers, anything to to kind of um, if you can divert that responsibility away from 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 yourself and put it with someone else, use a contract manufacturer where you can. Um, yeah. That that does help kind of with that that initial investment and it gives you the gives you the security without the the, the massive outlay. Yeah, it's like it's so, so moving the responsibility is the key. Um, yeah. I mean, Will, Will again, it's like you've jumped about fifty percent in volume, if I understand correctly, recently, which must be putting strain on your Auckland production. But what's, how how are you managing this this future planning when you don't know how sustained this wave will be at the moment? Yeah, so um, I think 
that's that's one of the key challenges for a small business. I mean, we've got a staff of um, 10. You know, we're a really small business within our capacity, which we, we believe is sort of punching above our weight um, in terms of how we do it. So, you know, our, our volume's gone up 400% over the last COVID period um, and drawn down all our stock. Uh, to Paul's point, um, I think uh, it's really around to bringing the people in to really create the um, the product and therefore making optimised, the most optimised manufacturing plan you can within your your current facility and we're not we don't want to be putting a huge amount of money into capex at this point because of the we don't know what's going to be happening in the future by but, but bringing people in and growing our team and our capability within our team is a really easy way for us to do that um you know we're also investing in new mach- machinery as well um which will help us increase our capacity within um our um, I guess our current um, working hours um, that we operate in. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's, it's really as we look to the future, um, uh, where we invest our money, um, we need to be sure that that's going to deliver the return um, and also um, to offset that, making sure that we've actually diversified our channels, um, our channels and where we're selling um, to make sure that we can balance that in the future as well. You know, my prediction is our US business will come back to where we were beforehand. However, if, um, you know, over this time, we've launched a new website in the US. Um, we're looking at India. We're looking at Singapore. We're looking at Australia um, as well from an Amazon point of view to really diversify our channels. Um, and, you know, if we can upscale our, um, our manufacturing capacity, it means we can attack those um, channels uh, really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Again, with this, like, so this is the the, con- the concept of mitigating the risks. But mm. I guess lots of the conversations we've had in this series, we've had the um, the freedom to be optimistic. But here today, it's like you, you can't open up the channels without working out actually how to reduce that additional capacity um, and do it sustainably. Um, Todd, I'm, I'm really interested in in your thought processes at the moment as you plan ahead like, beyond this this crisis to look for potential new places where you may want to manufacture across across the world and how you weigh up the, 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 these really, really big picture risks um, and, and, and almost macroeconomic moves that might make you move from country to country and hopefully one day perhaps even towards New Zealand again. Um, it's like, how, how, do you, how do you manage that planning process? Because you're, you're dealing with the minutiae of, 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 um, um, of volume control and getting optimized production and managing people to this, this this big, big, big long-term picture thinking, and you've been bringing the two together. What, what's, what, what's, the, what's the tip? Yeah, look, I mean, we're still in fight mode. Uh, it's not quite survival. It's a bit more optimistic than that. But, but look, I, th- I think we spend a lot of... We've got two engineers, including uh, the founder of Blunt, um, who's a 46-year-old, very smart fella and the inventor of Blunt Umbrellas. We're working on um, line extensions to help our business. So... By looking at a line extension that we're looking to release, you know, in the next six months, it will, we need to get out, we need to be able to get our bums on a plane anyway, but we need to get out into the world, start looking for alternative um, options. But, you know, we're also looking um, uh, to countries in the past that have transformed their economies uh, in, in a generation. And to give you an example, Taiwan, um, with the whole silicon chip manufacturing, um, when it started with three blokes sitting around a table having a coffee um but that's how we're viewing it so look ultimately our goal would be to bring um manufacturing down to new zealand because we're a new zealand product um and but we're manufactured in 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 china so that's kind of the broken bit of our story and there's no reason why we couldn't but we do have to join uh industry with the government and i was talking to simon before as well about how the norwegians keep smashing the new the kiwi salmon um, you know, operators out of the water because they're funded by the government. They've got a, a industry-led but government-funded um, attack on Asia. And I think they've done a great job um, over the last five years. We also need to do the same thing. So we need to be smarter about the innovation. Uh, you know, the smaller bits that, that we, we, it's kind of like we're, we've got all the ingredients to make a cake, but we're making pikelets, you know? <laughs> I think if you raise a really, really interesting point, the best metaphor of the day, you definitely win with that. Um, <laughs> they, um, it's like one of, one, of the most, one of the most shocking stats that I've seen recently um, has come out from the number of WTO members who have who implemented immediately really, really restrictive protectionist policies. I believe it was, like, it was 80 WTO members as soon as the crisis hits and put in up to 100 new restrictions for exports. So you had this, this wave on, 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 on top of, um, of political nationalism 
um, coming here, this wave of protectionism that, that, that's, that's coming in. Um, it's like from, from somebody who straddles um, um, different continents like, like you do, Todd, this is like, is, is this, is, is, is nationalism and protectionism here to stay? And, and how should we think and respond to this, this trend um, as exporters? I mean, it probably is here to stay, but it's always been there. I mean, anyone that's exported into, say, Asia knows that the barriers into Indonesia have always been there. Um, the barriers into China when they shut their border. I mean, I was living there in 2008, 9 and 10, and I can tell you now they shut that border twice and they did it for their own reasons. So nothing's changing. Uh, does it get a little bit more complicated? Should we be doing the same thing uh, down here in New Zealand? Absolutely. Uh, trying to get Antipodes water, you know, one of New Zealand's greatest pure water sources into India, can't do it, right? It was never going to work, but, you know, um, here they are exporting to the rest of the world. I think, I think um, again, it needs to be, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much bigger, it's a much bigger, a longer term strategy that needs to be led by industry, but obviously, you know, a whole lot of, uh, you know, help from, from government officials, the free trade agreements, yeah, they work to a point. They probably work better for someone like Paul, who's uh, also manufacturing in China. Uh, they, they, but for small brands coming up through the ranks, um, they don't really matter to, to us at, at all, really. Not in the early days, anyway. Yeah, I mean, there are. I mean, there is the promise of, of US, EU, and South American free trade deals in the pipeline. Again, Minister Parker mentioned them this week. I mean, Paul, is, is that a source of optimism for you? Or does that does the possibility of that affect your longer term strategy? Yeah, we don't. Yeah, I mean, we're quite lucky in the in the space that we're not in in the kind of high sensitive areas with trade um, with with transformers, which is good. I, I kind of view that whole globalization, anti globalization, as a bit of an ebb and a flow. Um, we are, as a global, hugely reliant on each other, but there's some political leaders around at the moment that are trying to shut that down. Um, hopefully, there's changes afoot near the end of the year that can you know get us all back on track again. But I think you yeah, know we. We all manufacture out, you know, everyone manufactures in China. And so that, that kind of, and then parts coming in from all over, you know, uh, I, the number of times that pieces of equipment go across the Atlantic before they end up as a finished product is just, is just incredible. And so, you know, we, that reliance is a reality, but the backlash to it is as well. Um, but uh, I think we'll, you know, we'll forge ahead with something a bit more sensible, hopefully um, early next year. Are there, are, are there elements, um, Simon, from government support that will be really useful for exporters at the moment? Things that, that might be that might be missing? Um, I don't know. I mean, we saw, have experienced previously and still continue to have uh, amazing support from NZT, both here in Nelson and in the export market. So from where I sit, I don't, I don't think so. I don't... Uh, I can't think of anything that jumps out that additional government support is required. Um, I think the way that we've you know, kind of supported uh, our business and, and people through the, the um, COVID period has been has been great. Um, how do they continue to support business uh, in the recovery phase? You know, look, I'm not sure I'm probably the wrong person to ask that, but uh, I wouldn't mind making a point back uh, to a discussion we were talking earlier, and that was around, you know, supply and supply out of um, different countries for export. And one of the things we did when we started as a small uh uh, brand with uh, Omega Plus Pet Food was to um, have our packaging um, made and supplied out of a New Zealand supplier. Uh, the reason we did that was because uh, we, we knew that um, you know, prices out of China were cheap. Uh, however, uh, your lead times were very long. Uh, your MOQs were, were very big. Um, and there was a, a cost to getting it wrong. If you needed to change packaging, mm -hmm. you, if you oversold, undersold, um, and without any uh, sales history, we had no idea what we were going to require. So we, we went with a local um, packaging uh, supplier, probably 30% more expensive than what we'd pay for out of China. But, um, you know, shipping times from China to New Zealand, 10 weeks, probably a bit longer. Uh, now lead times reasonably the same. Uh, difference being once it's produced out of the factory in Hamilton, it can be with us within two days. So we kind of look to, uh, you know, four years ago when we set up, have that production done here for different reasons. Uh, but as it turns out, again, to be very advantageous. It costs you more to produce in New Zealand, but it gives you flexibility. It gives you some sort of security uh, that you're going to get your packaging. Because I'm pretty sure there would have been a lot of food manufacturers out there. In China, sat there, shut down, thinking, when's my next uh, packaging uh, shipment turning up? 
uh, is it going to be here in time to meet uh, our production schedules? Yeah, on top of that. So if, if I can just paraphrase that back to you, what you were suggesting here is that the, the macroeconomic drive for protectionism to bring manufacturing back home actually isn't as important as thinking about elements of your of the of your um, components of manufacturing as being as being at risk. So if you can, the, the closer these are to home, actually the fewer risks you have around that. Is that is that is, is that a fair? Yeah, in some in some situations, and and this year being that situation, um, like I said, we we initially set it up for flexibility. Uh, it was never done because it was um, you know going to save us money. It was done because we could react faster and and fill gaps quicker. Uh, as it turned out, it just um, you know when when China shut down and and world logistic supply chain started to struggle, um, you know to, to keep up. No one is, I'm, I'm surprised, Paul, you'll be able to, you're able to fly things uh, around places because with fresh salmon into North America, we're paying up to $8 a kilo just to get fresh salmon on a plane uh, and delivered. So that make a lot of money when your, uh, your freight goes up by uh, you know, a huge chunk like that. So, um, yeah, just... So that's just, just on, that, on that point, Simon, when, when you get a shock like that, I mean, just, and, we, and we've heard it from lots of people over the last few weeks and just how... how how damaging that, that, that lift in air freight costs are. Does, does this mean that you have to be planning for actually downsizing production in some ways to be able to get through this from the fresh summer point of view? So should we be thinking about no, getting up? Absolutely not. No, no, we're going to increase production. We're just going to increase it in different uh, places. So it's all about channel selection, really. So we, as I said earlier, we, we realized that uh, being 70% food service reliant on our salmon business uh, left us incredibly exposed. As an aquaculture company, we have to take 160 tonnes out of the water every week of salmon, no matter what. Uh, when that demand, that sales demand dropped out, um, we were left holding, you know, 100 tonne of salmon a week uh, that had to go into the freezer. So what that showed us is that uh, our retail space performed extremely well in New Zealand. Um, and in fact, in North America, uh, we're selling, sending um, high value, ready to eat products, frozen in, in containers. Um, you know, and, and the Supply chain for uh, ship containers is a bit more uh, solid than air freight. So what we're doing, I guess the, the word I've heard there through COVID from a business perspective is pivot. Uh, you know, if you're all over the place, we're looking to pivot. Everyone's uh, pivoting. Take, yeah, everyone's pivoting. Yeah, we're all bent in the middle. Uh, <laughs> hope you're doing your yoga. Um, yeah, so we, we are actively looking to increase the output of our factories, going to increased um, shift patterns, uh, running, uh, as, as much as we can whilst maintaining food uh, safety and, and uh, cleanliness, um, but you know, into retail a lot more just to diversify, uh, allow us to um, uh, you know, produce product that can be shipped. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's been a real exercise and, and have you selected the right channel for your company? Are you playing in the right, uh, in the right playground? And how do you um, make sure you're not playing in just one? Because if that door closes, you got nowhere to go. Yeah, that, that, that's, that, that change in channel selection is a really good lesson for us all. I mean, I mean, Paul, from a specialist manufacturing point of view, when like your number of customers and channels is, 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 is a little bit more limited, how do, you, how do you build contingency in your plans? You're plainly, you've, you've, got, you've got one or two big customers at the present moment whose demand has gone up, so you're following yep. that through. But how are you, how are you what, what's your, your um, uh, version of Simon's um, channel pivot here to make sure that you don't come off the edge of this and, and take yeah, a big fall again? We, we don't hit you. Yeah, we've probably got one channel, so that, but we, we're across multiple industries, so it's a bit more of an industry pivot. Yeah. And so we, you know, we're into agriculture, we're into medical, we're into uh, communications. So, um, you know, for us, and then then on top of that, it's it's um, looking at export, you know, export markets to grow. So um, on one hand, we're trying to heavily preserve cash, but at the same time, uh, I think that it's it's naive to think we're not going to lose a, you know, a customer or two um, through the process. We don't want that to happen, but I think we need to prepare that it, that, that that may happen. And then so where are we? We're, we're our next. Um, next new customers coming from so so looking at new markets that is that that's having to lose a customer or two strategically is terrifying I mean, I mean will yeah. i understand that you moved um from a, like from a, a b to b focus to a b to c quite heavily through the crisis how, how did that feel to have to sacrifice um and the needs of some key relationships for the security of the business yeah, so we uh, in February we were in Sydney with probably a hundred thousand people at a trade show, a B two B trade show, and we picked up probably you know sixty seventy orders from customers. Um, two weeks later, the flights had stopped and our customer orders disappeared. 
Um, so, I mean, you know, so over, it felt like overnight that a B2B model had disappeared. The ones that were still retailing had a diverse um, supply chain and we were able to, to work with them. Um, however, just to focus on our business and to make sure our commercial viability, we had to make the call that we um, stopped supplying our B2B channel um, until next month probably um, and really focus on making, we focus on where the margin is. Um, and that was in our... Um, in our export market, um, the US dollar is so strong um, to enable us to bank that dollar and continue the growth forward uh, and invest in what could be the future um, of our business as well and make sure our B2C channel is bigger. So then we can come back and you know supply the capacity back to the B2B in the future. I mean, our B2B channel was, is our, I guess, from where we started really um, and, and is still really important from our brand point of view. Um, however, it's, it's sort of definitely taken a back seat over this last six weeks. Yeah, it's, it takes an awful lot of discipline to make those channel changes. It does feel like a sacrifice because, I mean, like business is, is ultimately yeah. personal. And one of the things that you mentioned there is that when the flights stop, the work stop. And I, I, Todd, I, when you're working into, into overseas manufacturing, but also into overseas export markets, face to face contacts and trade shows, like Will said, are, are, are essential. Um, those you know, it's like, it's not looking, it's not looking like doors are going to open immediately and we're going to have unfettered access to everyone everywhere. We're going to have to go through a year or two of, of quite limited human touch. What, what, what do you do to replace those trade shows and the really important um, cultural, personal um, points of human connection that you need to build relationships with your market partners and your production plants over there? Yeah, we had, a, um, to give you an example, we had a BDM working out of the Auckland office into Australia. So we took back distribution from our Australian distributor uh, a year ago, actually, this month. And, um, and in terms of, you know, a size of a market for us, it's, it's, it, it's a, it wasn't doing that well, but it was a, a half a million dollar uh, market for us a year, really no cost, um, and, and at, at a low margin. So somewhere it was a mid-30s margin. Um, we took back distribution. We just sold a million dollars uh, through till March 31st in our first kind of 10 months in that market at 62% margin. So we've actually really increased that by, by owning that market ourselves. So um, here we go. We're going nicely. We've just signed up David Jones. We're talking to Maya. We're just about, you know, getting, getting that old snowball effect. And, yeah. and, and now we can't get our BDM on a plane to get back over there. So we ran the risk of uh, losing all that good work. So... What we did is we employed someone in the middle of COVID uh, over there that just been laid off. Um, that's selling a New Zealand brand. We kind of had uh, we we knew of them because <laughs> from the home fragrance industry, that's where they were playing. So in similar channels. So what we did is we offered this person a, a position, and she took it. And so we're up and running as of next week back into Australia. We don't have to get on a plane uh, to do that. And what we did is we rerouted our BDM into Australia and we've given him the focus of Asia. And so uh, over the last four weeks, he's just been researching the shit out of Asia and working alongside uh, the team at NZTE to give us access to the BDMs and the focus of the target market. Um, and saying that, we also, uh, we also um, went live uh, in the UK, but that was obviously planned from six months ago, but we went live about three weeks ago, which is, you know, for, it's a perfect storm, excuse the pun, you know, we sell umbrellas. Uh, we've yeah. just had the driest and warmest spring ever, and we're in the middle of COVID. Yeah. But you know what? Um, we, we committed to that market. We're, we're in it for the long haul. So that's a 12-month launch plan. Um, we don't expect, we never expected to make money. We, we didn't want to bleed, but we thought we could break even in that first 12 months. That's what we're geared up for. But even, you know, from talking to our girl up there, it's a boots-on-the-ground strategy for us always um, as small startup brands because... If you haven't got an evangelist out there pushing your brand, then no one else is going to do it, right? So we've, uh, we've actually, uh, we've, we've heard last night that they're actually starting to open their stores um, this weekend from this weekend. So, you know, New Zealand's come back on track pretty quick. It's like we're back to normality almost without getting on too many planes outside of New Zealand. I'd say UK is going to be the same. We've just changed a 20-foot container, a 40-foot uh, container into the U.S., that's going to uh, San Fran and then into New York. So, you know, I think the world's coming on back on track a little bit faster than maybe the doom and gloom that we're, that we, I, look, I'm not doubting there's going to be blood on the streets somewhere, and we know that already. But I think we're, 
if we stay in fight, fight mode for a little while, we'll navigate ourselves through it. And we are small, we are agile as a nation. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty optimistic still. Yeah. yeah, so it's like we've got to stay on our toes. Um, Simon, you've got the same problem to stretch that metaphor in terms of boots on the ground because you've got huge expansion plans for your pet food business um, this year. How are you planning now um, as a contingency to not be able to get into markets, not see people? What, what's, what's your approach? Uh, yeah, I was supposed to be in China and Europe last month, you know, a month away from New Zealand, uh, traveling to look at the market. So that door slammed shut. Um, very similar approach to Todd, actually. We, um, rather than going to market, what we've realized is that there is, uh, in the food service game, lots of uh, importers, distributors who were out of business. Um, they were known to our company. They were importing our uh, premium food service brand, Aura King. Uh, overnight, um, they lost their... Uh, ability to make income basically so we actually uh, um, contracted uh, open contracts um, people in uh, Canada uh, and in um, in UK uh, doing some work for us up there uh, you know the the expense of putting people in market at the moment is uh, is very very cheap rather than hopping in a plane and flying up there we've got people positions uh, at source uh, in the market uh, grateful to be making some money uh, through this period and uh, doing a really, really great job. Um, so there's a lot of synergies between what they were doing with um, uh, fresh chilled seafood and pet food, who would have figured. But uh, for us, it's uh, probably been a, a key learning is that, uh, you know, there is no substitute for feed on the ground. Uh, and if you look a little bit outside the box, you can find people who will uh, do a very, very good job for you. Yeah, it's just turning. That's amazing. Um, just it's almost using assets that you had already, but just using them for a different purpose. Um, yeah, I mean, raw material sourcing out of Canada and Europe of, of salmon byproducts. Um, they already had uh, the you know logistics, supply chain, uh, freezer uh, capacity. They had all that stuff in their business already. So very, very transferable. Lots of synergies. So very, very seamless. Smooth. Yeah. It's like, I guess, like sometimes the answer's right in front of us. Um, it's like mm. we're faced with a problem. Um, Never been Hamish, forced to look. Um, Hamish, just on the, uh, it's, like, it's 10 minutes to the hour, just watching the clock. Um, I think it's probably time for uh, a poll and some questions. What do you think? Oh, you don't think anything, so you're on mute. That's okay. That's all right, too. <laughs> I like it when you're the strong silent. So experience, so experience at this. Like <laughs> so, you're a pro. What we'll do, so um, I, I actually, I had some questions come through via text, which was a bit unusual, but anyway, that'll work, would have worked. So we've got, um, we'll, do a, we'll do a poll, and as we're doing the poll, people could also just, um, if you've got any other questions, put them into the Q&A. Um, we've, we've had some in there, we've answered some of them online, but we'll, we'll maybe get some other input as well. But here's just the, the, the good old uh, confidence one, compared to last week, are you more or less confident of a recovery in your export markets? So um, that's been up over the over the last few weeks. So let's see how yeah, you feel about that. See how that's see how that's tracking. And and actually, just one one of the questions that came through, like a you know big item on the agenda this year is the general election. And does what what role does the manufacturing sector have to play? Um, here and what have we got here support or neglect in favor of services so yeah I'm trying to trying to weave this together we've got the general election coming up <laughs> as manufacturers like you know like we you know you're creating creating jobs you're creating profit that create taxes etc what do you think manufacturers need to be doing or talking to government about to actually um have have uh, the country like grow and you know thinking you know some of the things you've said Todd about uh, you know how can we have a, a, a bigger picture here like do a Norway on, on this like what, what do you think is there anything else to elaborate on that maybe Todd or, or Paul? Yeah I think I think we just need to set up a business environment that's more specific or has a single-minded purpose you know um, mm. that uh, yeah that we that where we kind of join you know uh, that the businesses, you know, the smaller businesses, um, with with the funding from the government, and to make just a just a longer term strategy. Like, uh, mm -hmm. even we should just be packaging up uh, New Zealand products and charging more margin for it. I mean, we need to package them smaller. We can't the commodities that we don't be selling milk products unless it's in a small five hundred 
you know, gram bag, um, you know, or, or bottle. And we don't want to be selling, uh, you know, all our, our trees offshore. And we, we should be packaging things up in a smaller way, shape, form and, and selling it, uh, chasing the, the um, you know, the, the high margin and the, and the high growth channels. I mean, that's how we see it. But I, again, I come from small startup mentality, but we've always been like that. Chase the high margin options, chase the high growth categories. Yeah, and, and, and chasing that opportunity is what the discussion today has been all about. And that's like every pivot that we've done, everybody yoga, that's been, been making sure that we're, we're into the space where we can manage and extend that margin. And Hamish, I think we've got time for one more question before yeah. we... Okay. You know, yeah. So, so this one here is like back in back in February. This looked like it was going to be a China problem, but it ended up being bigger than that. Uh, so, so Paul, um, out of interest, what learnings have you you know can you take from from this to carry forward into the future? You know, from a contingency planning point of view. Yeah, I, I and I I've. I was offshore for a long time before I joined my current business. And I think um, we all look at risk or events as, as small, you know, the, the, the chance of these things happening is very, very small, but the chance of something happening is actually quite large. So whenever we're looking at our business and looking at risk profile, I think that's, yeah, it's, it's got to be, you know, you plan for that word, plan for the worst and hope for the best. Um, so yeah, we all need to, you know, step back. If we, you know, even when things are going great, step back and go, okay, what, what, what could go wrong here, and what do we need to do to mitigate that? And we can't. None of us can. You know, none of us expected this. Um, you know, uh, twelve months ago. But you know, for a, for a, for an event like this to happen and and to happen in the future, they will. So how do we get our businesses into a sh into the best shape we can to be able to buffer the buffer the storm? Mm. There is that. Uh, there's that saying: the most dangerous number in business is one. You know, one, yeah. one key supply chain, one key yeah. market, one key channel there. And, and I think that's really, you know, for many businesses, brought that to light. You know, and, and it's how to get that appropriate diversification. You know, because uh, you know, Todd, talking to your point, uh, you know, before we we you know earlier this morning about there's an aspect you've got to focus to um, channel your time and energy and money resources. But at the same time, you can't be so narrow that you um, create a massive risk in your business. Yeah. We have this saying in our business, we, um, we stole it from a little wine business down uh, in Marlborough actually. Uh, but it says like think and act global, but love local. Um, and at the moment we're just treading lightly with that, but it's, it's, it, that's the way for blunt. It's putting more blunts in the hands of, of more fans. And, and that's our single-minded vision. And so everything else drops out of that. And that, that comes down to, you know, the strategy around people, uh, people in the business. So we didn't, we didn't, when we came into COVID, we weren't looking to lay people off. We knew that we wanted to keep as many people on as possible for as long, amount, as, as, long as we could. So we, we knew that before COVID happened. Um, and so, yeah, we had to drop down at 20% reduction in incomes. But are already going back up to that on 1st of July, right? So a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, customer obsession, you know, like we sell a bloody umbrella for God's sake. I mean, like, let's face it, there's got to be other good umbrellas out there, right? But actually, how do we keep the customers that we've got? Well, we, we become more obsessed with them. And that's not just D to C, that's also our distributors and the people that are building our brand for us. Yeah, right. And then right. the last bit is just honest innovation. And that comes back down to New Zealand. Like what's our long-term plan around if we're going to sell trees, wood up to Asia, what's the long-term plan on that? Is that sustainable? Uh, ultimately, every business wants to be more sustainable. They're just at different parts of that, of that track. Um, but what, what we're working on is that it's our pointy bit. That's our true north. Yeah. Mm, mm. True north. That's, um, I like that. I like that as a way to probably wrap. And wrap, on that, wrap, on wrap that. that. Yeah, I've got, this, uh, got the poll. Here, okay. so we are looking at what's good news here is we've got two thirds of people are more confident um, about uh, the recovery and export market. So that's fantastic versus uh, 27 the same and 7% uh, a bit less confident there. So, so that's, uh, that's interesting. Good to see. We'd like to end on a happy note, don't we, Hamish? Yeah, um, yeah. I hadn't checked that, but anyway. So well, I, I usually like to. I take like one week off and 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 I uh, you know you forget, you forget the lose, uh, lose all my happy. Um, 
Paul, let's, let's, let's wrap this up because we're almost on the hour. On top of this, can you just give us a reason to be cheerful, um, please, moving into this next week? Um, it's a brave new world out there. There's, there's opportunities in the change. And I think, uh, you know, just keep an eye out for those opportunities. Yeah, there's some hard times ahead, but, um, you know, New Zealand's come out of this looking strong. Um, we've got a great international profile and um, I, I reckon great things will come of that. Nice, inspiring words. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Will, um, give us a reason to be cheerful, mate. Well, you know, I just get colouring with crayons. I mean, why not? <laughs> colouring is, you know, it makes you feel great. <laughs> no, I, 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 think this, I think this is creating a lot more opportunity than what people, um, people underestimate the opportunity that is going to come out of this and um, people are getting, uh, having a lot more fun doing it and get out there and, and focus on those positives um, and attack those positives, um, you know, with everything you've got. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, what Paul said, there might be some bumpy roads in the middle, but wow, it's um, it's a it's a crazy world, and um, you just got to keep positive about those good things that are going to happen. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much for your insight today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you with us. Hopefully, we'll see you again very soon. Um, Todd, your reason to be cheerful, please. Well, the rain's coming, right? Pray for rain. That's all we need. Only man happy. <laughs> but uh, to be honest, I mean, there's opportunity everywhere. I mean, we are so single-minded. We we map out the wettest suburbs and the wettest cities in the world now. We know that Melbourne actually rains more often than Sydney, but Sydney rains, when it rains, it rains a lot. We know that Manchester rains more than London. We just hone in on uh, the rain and, you know, it's going to be raining somewhere in the world, right? So we're okay. <laughs> 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 I'll leave you to follow the clouds. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you with us, Tosh, and we'll see you again soon. Um, Simon, you've got the last words, um, last happy words, if you would. Yeah, super Rugby starts this weekend. Uh, <laughs> there's cold beer in the fridge and some good wine as well. So, uh, hey, listen, we're the same. Um, look, I think New Zealand's going to come out of this uh, smelling a little bit like, like roses. There's um, around the world, people will be very envious. We play in agriculture, and I think as, as far as agriculture goes, uh, we're going to come out, uh, I think, very, very strong. Um, people want safe food. Uh, how do you find safe food? You've got to sophisticated companies that, uh, or sorry, countries that can, can produce quality products, and we're really well positioned. Um, I think uh, we're going to see a groundswell. Uh, as long as we can realise the potential, uh, to Todd's point, let's value add, capture that at home, put it in our bank accounts, not somebody else's. There we go. Let's let's get our hands wrapped around that. Um, Simon, it's been great having you on. Um, we'll see you soon in Nelson, we hope. Um, it's been a pleasure having you with us as well uh, there in the audience. Yep. Um, thank you so much for joining us. There is no after party today, um, unfortunately. Um, we don't have to have time for that. Um, some things have taken over. But we will, of course, be back in the same place at the same time. Um, Hamish and Wellington, myself um, in Auckland um, for more. Um, more panellists insights um, at 10 o'clock um, next Friday. Um, so until then, a um, huge thank you um, to, to Todd and to Will, to Paul, to Simon, and of course to Hamish, um, who's been driving all the buttons um, in the right way. Um, take care. Stay home. We'll see you next Friday at 10. Take care. See you Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks Cheers. very much, everyone. Cheers. Good up.